So this is our first event of our dissertation week. And today we're going to be looking at the data that's available for dissertations. My name is Jen and I work at the University of Manchester and I'm part of the UK data service team. And I've spent a lot of time working on data from some of the large social surveys that are available to be used. And my co-host in this session is Nigel. And Nigel's also a part of the UK Data Service team at the University of Manchester. And he knows uh, a lot about the census and also survey data. So we're going to first look at what the UK Data Service is and some of the data that we've got. And then importantly, we're going to consider why you might want to use it in a dissertation. We'll go through some information about how you find and access data. And then importantly, some of the resources that we've got available and um, that might be able to help you when you're doing your dissertation. And then we'll finish off by talking about our dissertation award. Um, we've then got sort of dedicated time for questions, uh, your questions at the end. Um, but you can ask questions as we go through. So um, we invite you to use the, the Q&A panel in the software and you can just type your questions in at any point and we might be able to stop as we go through the session but if we don't pick it up at that point we'll come back to those questions at the end so if anything pops into your head just put it into the question and answer box um, everyone's going to stay muted on uh, in the session and um, so the chat and the q a are the main points we're also going to be using Mentimeter, so yeah, Nigel, if you move on to the next slide, in this session. So to test it out, um, if you could please go to menti.com and use the code uh, that's above. I will just um, pop in a link in case that helps. Here's a link. So if you go to menti.com and then type in the code that's above the screen. So that's 26467433. And I can see some people are starting to come through. So here we're asking what subjects that you're studying. I just keep this going. Oh, I like seeing it when it moves up and down, get a mix as it's happening. So that's looking good so far. We've got a nice mix of disciplines and hopefully you'll find out that there's some data that's likely to appeal right across these different subjects. We've got quite a lot of people in sociology. If anyone in the other section would like to tell us where what you're studying in the chat box, that would be lovely to know. Um, quite a few criminologists. Um, so economics and psychology. So it's a really interesting mix of people. Oh, we've got some coming through optometry and theology, speech and language communication, epidemiology. This is brilliant. So a nice real mix of um, people studying different subjects. OK, so if we move on um, to what is the UK data service? So the UK Data Service is a service that provides access to a wide range of social science data. And it's used by people doing research in universities, but also um, government and think tanks and businesses too. And the important bit is that it can be used by students too. So it's a resource that's available for you. And we also, the UK Data Service also provides training and support. So we do things like this webinar and we've also got resources online um, and both the data and our resources you can all find out about through our website. And we have a very large data catalogue with a wide range of data in. So the types of data that we've got is we've got some, uh, the, the main types we've got are some uh, data from nationally representative surveys of the UK and some from other countries as well. We've got data from some major longitudinal studies which are following individuals over time. We have um, data from the UK census and also data from qualitative studies. So this might be things like interview transcripts from uh, projects that researchers have done. 
And we also have um, international data. So this is often time series data from organizations such as the World Bank. And we're gonna give some more details as we go on about these different data types, but there's a big variety of data that's in our catalog. And topics, um, so, the combined data in our collection covers a really wide range of social science topics. So it ranges from things to do with um, people at work, um, people's family life, their health and their finances. So whatever you're working on, there's a good chance that there, there may be some data that's available um, that's relevant to your project. And I think one of the best ways to find out is to have a little quick look yourself. So I'm gonna ask you just to take a few minutes, so just about four minutes to have a little look at what's in our data catalog um, to see if there's things that interest you. So I'm gonna put a link into the chat for you. There. Um, so if you go through what you can see, this is a section of our website where you can kind of browse through some of the data to get a feel for what we have. And you can look at some themes. So we've got some data that's organized around some key themes. And then you can see some of the types of data. So just spend a few minutes exploring around and see if there's anything that's interesting or relevant to you. Um, we've got a question in there, Jen, about accessing the data from outside the UK. Yeah, a number of our users are from outside the UK, and there is no issue. You do need to be um, registered with the UK data service, and there's a process for registration. Um, but as a student, you won't have a problem access accessing it from outside the UK. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, a couple of more questions in chat there, Jen. Not to... Yeah, I've seen them. So, um, yeah, I think it, it, it's sort of time to come back anyway. So will there be data about social media, like YouTubers or any kind of social media influencer? So um, the data that we have available, we don't have social media data as in things like pulled off um, Twitter or Instagram. Um, we do have some information about how people use social media, but if, it, if you, what you're looking at is sort of getting data from, from social media platforms, um, we don't hold that kind of data. But on our website, you can, um, we're doing some work and we've got some training around how to um, scrape data from these kind of platforms so that you can build your own data set. So if that's something of interest um, to you, then, then we might be able to point you in the direction of some resources on there. Um, the next question that we have is, um, some data can't be accessed though, how can we fully use them? So I'm going to talk a little bit about access um, later on. So just as a, a short bit now is the data in our catalogue, there's different licenses that come with it and some you can access very easily and some you need to apply for and I'll talk through again which you can and cannot use for a dissertation slightly later on in the session. Okay and we've got someone right, brilliant who's interested in doing the web scraping for their dissertation so yeah we'll um, we'll pick that up in a moment. Um, what I'd like to do now is to move on into a quick quiz question here oh I can see that it's uh people are already going through. so which of the following do you think we have in our collection so if you can just pop to menti.com again and answer so the options are 30 years of data from a survey of British public opinion interview transcripts relating to the regulation of bingo regular survey of UK households uh, on the impact of covid and transcripts from parliamentary debates and data from children born in 2000 at seven different time points. Um, while we're, we're waiting, I'll just pick up on this question of, um, so someone's asked about data for care experience children and any tips on how to find this data. So um, I don't entirely know what kind of data you're for, so I'm gonna presume you might be looking for quantitative data 
um, on care experience children. So one of the things you might want to do is look at surveys of young people so you can get a representative sample of young people. So there's something called the Millennium Cohort Study that's been following lives of children from 2000. So that might be an interesting one to look at because some of that sample will include care experienced children. Um, we don't have access to sort of any administrative data on care experienced children. Um, so I think it would be either qualitative studies or um, survey data. So looking at those samples of young people. Coming back to this, so we've got every all of these uh, different things are things that we have in our um, collection, except transcripts of parliamentary debates. So the first relates to the British Social Attitudes Survey. So this is a survey that's been running since the 1980s. The second is from a qualitative study that's looked at things to do with the regulation of uh, bingo, which is a kind of majorly profitable gambling form. Um, we've got the Understanding Society COVID-19 study. So that was running through um, this from the start of the pandemic, interviewing households about socioeconomic impacts of COVID. And then the final one is the Millennium Cohort Study. So this is a longitudinal study following the lives of people born in the millennium. For information, um, you can find transcripts of parliamentary records available through Hansard. So at this point, I'm going to then pass you over to Nigel to talk about why you might consider using uh, data from us in your dissertation. OK, so um, just to start with, just thinking about what are the benefits, what are the issues that you might have. Um, it's clearly easier in terms of time, money and effort if we hold the data that will help you answer the research questions you are interested in. Um, you also know that the data is kind of from a broader sample, so it might come from the past, it might be much larger than you could gather yourself, uh, it might come from other countries, and it has been through process just to make sure it's of a certain type of quality. So um, in most of our survey data, you can uh, use the mechanisms there to make claims about representative issues in the population. Um, the disadvantage is that the data that you want might not always be available, or more commonly, it might not be perfect. You might find that what you're trying to explain um, is not quite covered by the variable that's been collected, but it might be good enough. And it, it is a challenge because these surveys are large, so it can be harder to understand. So talking to colleagues, this kind of part of understanding the data you're set you're working with is a significant investment in time. Um, hopefully we're here to help you in this session. We'll give you a flavour of ways to do that. So just to, to start with, sorry, um, if you could go on to Menti again and just type in your dissertation topic, just do it free form and um, we'll see what comes out from what you're saying. So I'll go back in a minute after we've done this. So if you, so this is called a word cloud. So what it's doing is picking up the words that you're using and um, kind of adjusting the size depending on the number of, of people who are saying the same thing. So at the moment, education is kind of sitting there in the middle as the largest one. It looks like it's picking them up individually, right? It's not picking up the individual words either. But if you look across that, there's a massive range of um, areas you're looking at. So there's things around health, uh, around safety, finance, um, wealth, well-being, anxiety, some big economic top topics like debt equity ratio. Um, 
quite a few criminology ones by the look of it. Okay, so I'll leave that on for a few seconds. So the next section really, I'm going to talk about the kind of data we have and um, try and identify whether we have things that you could use in your dissertation. Um, so just to summarize, we have time series data. Uh, so this is international data from sources like the World Bank and the um, Conflict Index. Uh, it's aggregated at country and regional level, um, different time series annually, quarterly and monthly. It's regularly updated and it includes these main kind of data sources covering a wide range of socioeconomic topics. And here, for example, is a um, data, a graph derived from that data. So it's looking at the proportion of seats held by women in national parliaments over time. So from 2009, when it was around 20% of seats were held by women, to 2019, where the number got up to 32%. So you can see um, kind of increasing representation of women. Now, that's, so gender equality does figure quite um, highly in international data sets, um, partly because of the gender equality index, as do aspects of human development. So for those interested in kind of broad comparative data across countries, um, this is a, a great resource to use or to think about using to explore. Um, we have UK census data from 1961 to 2011. Um, this year's census data will be available from, start being available from the middle of next year. So probably too late for most of you um, if you're using it for your dissertation this year. Uh, the census is important because it's used as a baseline for lots of other statistics and surveys. So when we have a survey, making it nationally representative is linking it back to reflect the population as we understand it from the census. There are a lot of topics. We hold data for small geographies. So this is probably one of the few data sets that gives you the ability to look at the geography of social phenomena. So the kind of outputs we get are aggregate table data at different geographical levels, um, boundary data to enable us to map that data um, and produce kind of charts and um, maps showing things. Flow data, which is used to um, show particularly things like commuting patterns, migration patterns. And we also have a data set that has micro data. So that has a number of the variables um, that you can do quite um, powerful analysis on. So from the 2011 data set, there are 2.8 million records on the one that is available by end user license. And these are some of the topics. So just to um, pick out some of them. So in terms of demographics, we have age, sex profile. So you could look at the profile, um, age and sex profile of different parts of the UK. Um, we have a whole set of questions around race and identity, um, religion. Um, we have things around social class, generally measured by occupational social class, language, education levels, um, migration, family and household type. So there's a wide range of information there. We have to, you have to be aware that this is taken at a particular place in time. So for example, employment would reflect where people were employed in April, 2021. Given the disruption caused by COVID, that may well be quite different. Um, their pattern of employment, their pattern of commuting may be quite different from what it would normally be. So we have a particular kind of issue with the 2021 census um, that some of the findings will be distorted by the effect of the pandemic. And here's an example of how this could be used to map geographical variations. So the map on the right is of England and Wales. Um, it's showing um, basically a color shaded, what's called a chloropleth map um, with the people, uh, percentage of people born in the UK who have no passport. Um, and as you can see, um, there is quite a lot of shading a lighter shading around where London 
um, and the southeast is. So it looks like more people there have passports. There are parts of the country where very low percentages of people, where higher percentages of people don't have passports. Um, and this kind of mapping can be done with many of the variables in the census table, tables. And then we have surveys. So there's a number of kind of major surveys that we look at. Um, so in terms of understanding employment and work, we have the labor force survey, which is carried out quarterly, also has a longitudinal element in that um, people are asked the same questions over five periods and is supplemented by an annual population survey. Um, we have information on health from the health surveys for England and Scotland. We have information on family, fan, family finances and what people spend their money on, what the costs of living are for individual families. And this is one way I think we can understand different costs of living between different people. We have a whole set of stuff around attitudes and opinions. Um, we have crime data um, and housing and the local environment. So a broad range of topics, and this is scraping the surface. There are more in here. Um, Last year I was teaching in a university and one of my dissertation students was asking about data about the 1981 riots. And we found in the UK data service, a Mori opinion poll taken just after the riots about attitudes to young people at the time, which was kind of quite interesting and quite varied data that I wouldn't have expected to find there. Um, and was a bonus to the student who will be working on that dissertation now, I suspect. So an example here is understanding society. So this is one of our largest surveys. Um, it takes 40,000 households and follows them over a long period of time. Within that, there are 100,000 individuals. Um, so all uh, members of a household are surveyed in different ways. So there are specific questions for 10 to 15 year olds, for example, um, to address uh, better understanding of race and ethnicity, there is a boost sample of ethnic minorities. And re in the last year and a half, there have been eight waves tracking COVID-19 related questions. Um, so it covers a set of topics, including employment and earnings benefits, party identification, finances, environmental behaviors, family life, ethnicity, religion, et cetera, et cetera. And it tracks those over a period of time. Um, so the question was, what is a boost sample? So because um, a random sample wouldn't select enough from each individual ethnic minority to enable um, proper statistical comparison, there is a sample collected additionally uh, which is targeted at raising those numbers of, of different ethnic groups. So any kind of boost sample is about rebalancing the sample you've collected. Um, the data is in the internationally comparable and can be used cross-sectionally or across waves. Uh, understanding society followed on from the British Household Panel Survey. So if you, um, a lot of researchers will go back over quite a long period of time to see what's happened. Um, a second survey we've mentioned already is British social attitudes. So this has been carried out nearly every year since 1983. It explores public attitudes and it's kind of driven by the, um, the interests of the day, I suppose. So it, what we can see is patterns of continuity and change within that. The samples are around 3,000. Every year there are core questions around background and um, aspects of identity. And then different modules are done on social, economic, political and moral issues. And each year there's a headline report from this, which is interesting reading, if only to see what people were interested in in the 80s, the 90s, etc. So there are quite different concerns at different times and sometimes echoes of the same kinds of concerns. Um, coming through. Um, the next section is around qualitative data. And um, 
I, I just found this one. There are there are various things. So when you search on the data service site, if your search topic is held in qualitative data, you will get a list back of things and you can specifically search for it. So this was looking at uh, youth justice workers' views on implementing policy. And the abstract here tells you what this is. So when you go into it, you will then get the transcripts of interviews collected as part of this study. Um, and you would also be able to see publications linked to this study. So qualitative data can be quite useful. We're not the only source of it, but it is a good secondary source of data um, for many studies. So let's just ask another question about what kind of data interests you. A good answer, Kush, I think. Kush just answered all, because I think it depends on your question, but you might find that um, your question will make use of different types of data. Okay, so that's with about 30 people answering. Um, quite a lot of people interested in qualitative data. Okay, I've got a question here from Sai about data not always being available. Um, I'll try and think of an example and get back and as I'm talking. But I suppose if you've got a specific question and you're interested in answering that, then you're looking for data that will help you answer it. Um, and sometimes the data we have might not be um, a perfect way of doing that. So, for example, I've worked with the English Housing Survey quite a lot. Um, and the English Housing Survey is interesting because it tries to ask um, people from across the whole social gradient. So it tries to talk to uh, people living in quite elite circumstances. And it does so, but in recording the income of those elite individuals, it caps it at £100,000 a year, which means you can't really see the really rich people and isolate them from that survey. So you kind of got an imperfect way of getting the views of the elite about aspects related to housing and their housing experiences. It's not the best example of that, but I think that's um, the kind of thing where you might find you're gonna to have to make some compromise either by taking a less than perfect measure or um, you know, leaving, um, looking for some other data source. Uh, we've got a question there about quantitative financial data, which I'm, I think we have got business data, but I, my feeling is that a lot of that is in secure labs. I don't know if Jen can complement that answer. Um, because it's commercially sensitive. Yeah, so if it's um, business data, a lot of that isn't available. So it's in the secure lab, uh, which means it has... Um, sort of secure access only and it's not possible to use that for a dissertation if it's household financial data then there's quite a lot of survey data with with details of um household finances so income benefits um and expenditures on different items um so I'd be interested to know a little bit more about what type of financial data Yes, yeah, sorry, that's right. It's the data. There will be data available, but it might not fully match your research question. So then you make a, a choice about how to deal with it. OK, so I'm going to move on and pass over to Jen again. Um, so I, I was going to share with you two case studies. So um, these are dissertations um, that students have done using data from the UK Data Service. And interestingly, they both use the same data set. So it, it but to look at quite different issues, so it shows some of the versatility that of the data sets that are available. So first we have a dissertation that um, looked to explore how social class influences perceptions of the environmental crisis and pro-environmental behaviors, such as buying recycled goods or doing different transport options. And they used um, understanding society data. 
And so in this dissertation, the student used um, a range of sort of statistical techniques to look at the types of behaviours that people do and then to examine how they vary by social class. And then they um, used some sort of more complex regression models to look at how these um, factors vary by social class when you can control for other factors, so things like age. And um, in their analysis, they found that there was a variety of class differences in perceptions, attitudes and behaviours. And then they went on in the conclusion to discuss what these findings might mean with reference to the literature that they'd read and reviewed at the beginning. And so when asked why they use this data, the, the student Elizabeth explained that um, she'd use the data because it allowed her to examine the topics that she was interested in. So um, environmental behaviours, but she could use a representative sample that was also large enough to examine differences across different socioeconomic groups. And then the next case study uh, also made use of understanding society. So if we just go, yeah, brilliant. So this was Rosarin who examined the effects of family and school attachments in relation to youth violence. So in this case, they used um, data from understanding society's youth questionnaire. So some of these large studies have sort of different um, so, so they might have their main sample, they might have the boost sample that we talked about before that allows you to look at certain groups. And here they do a specific youth questionnaire. So it's looking at um, a survey of the young people within the households of the main sample. And it looked at various aspects of young people's lives. So in her dissertation, she used, again, sort of a range of descriptive statistics and bivariate analyses to explore different aspects of family and school attachment and how they relate to violence. And then they um, used the data to do um, a regression analysis that could look at these multiple factors together. And again, Rosalind sort of chose this data because it gave her um, a nationally uh, representative sample of the, the sort of young people that she was interested in. So more than just any survey of uh, young people from a school, it was a nationally representative sample of young people. Um, so just looking at these two, there's lots of different possibilities, even from the same uh, study, um, different ways you might use it in your dissertation. And so next, I'm going to look at um, how you find data. So we've done this briefly just by looking uh, at the page before. Um, but the main bit about finding data from us is that we there's a searchable data catalogue that's available on our website. And there's an awful lot of data in this catalogue. So as Nigel was saying before, when he was looking after a dissertation student, he came across a study he'd never heard of before. So all sorts of things. When we look in this catalogue, uh, we find um, new and interesting things each time. And you can search through it using um, search terms um, like you would in any other sort of search tool. And then there's options for how you refine your search or sort some of the results. Um, and as you saw before, there's also some sort of data by themes as well. So those theme pages give some insights into data that's available on key topics, but it's not exhaustive of what's in the data catalog. And, um, but before, um, so I'm gonna go on to give you a demonstration and talk a little bit about how you might search the catalog. But I think what's really important first is to emphasize that, some of the other ways that you learn about what data is available. So as you're reading around your topic, um, you might come across studies that other people have used. So if you're reading the research that's been done on a, the topic of your dissertation, you'll find that some of the key data sets have been used before. So if you pay attention to the type of data that other studies have used, you might find an option that's suitable for you as well. 
and also talk to your supervisors about options of what studies they might be aware of. And a final option is librarians. So librarians actually have a great deal of knowledge about different types of data and how to search things like these data catalogues. Um, so if you are doing the search for data, um, these are also important things to think about before um, going on to, to search the catalogue. And so I'm going to now just share my screen. Um, so this is the UK Data Service homepage. And um, you can start searching for data from this this uh, homepage, we've got a search bar here and you can just type in um, a search term and then click search. Another option is you might know a particular data set that you're looking for. So a quick way of finding it is just to type in the name. So perhaps you've heard of Understanding Society and you've seen it being used in your area. So you can just type it in and it will ping up, um, bring up a list of the studies. And there's also this find data menu. And then from here, you can go to find and access and browse data. So these were the theme pages that you saw before. So that just picks up some key themes. We try and build on this um, as we go along um, with new themes there. And you can also, if you know what particular type of data you're looking for, you can start limiting your search by data types. So I'm going to give an example around searching for data on sort of mental health and well-being. So one of the things I can do is type in my search term, press search, and I now get some results here. So as you can see, this brings up over 2000 results with the search term well-being. Now, something that's worth highlighting is if you do slightly change uh, the spellings that you use, instead of hyphenating, I go for just well-being, I get a slightly different number of results. So it's worth, if you are sort of searching the catalog for uh, by a particular topic, it's just to try different search terms or different spellings of search terms. Um, and what you need to do at this point is to think about how data might be indexed. So um, if you're looking for survey questions that have looked around well-being, what other options there might be? So there's well-being and you can see some options that come up when you start typing it in. Um, or it might be that actually you want something more specific and you're interested in data that measures depression. So if I click on that, I get a slightly smaller number of studies. And then it comes to options for refining the search. So one of the things you might do is to, by default, it brings up all studies um, across all sort of periods. But if you want to actually just narrow it down to say the last five years, you can just add in um, the, um, the date and then refine as well. So now I've got, again, a smaller number of studies. So it starts to become a bit more manageable, the data that you're finding. And then you might want to look for data by a particular data type. So if you know you want survey data or you know you want qualitative data, you can click on these options here. So this process of searching for data um, is definitely, um, a time consuming aspect and you want to sort of spend a little bit of time looking through and trying different approaches so that you don't miss out on some uh, good study in your area. Um, we can also um, connect uh, search terms together. So if say I'm interested in the idea of well-being and how that relates to something else, such as housing, I can type in well-being and housing. And then this will search for all studies that have these two terms listed in them. So I start to see that I've got some information from the English housing survey coming up. Um, as well as um, some other big surveys. So it, it gives you the option to then start narrowing it down um, a little bit further. And we have two tabs here. 
we have studies and series. So if I go over to series, what this does is it brings up um, some of the major studies that have gone over time. So when there's more than one data, data set related to that study and it just lists the main study so here I've got the English housing study so if I'm interested in the idea of well-being and how it relates to housing it looks like the English housing study might be a good option to go for and if I find something that's interesting I just click on it and then it takes me through to the records for it so here I've got the, the sort of main page for the English housing study and you get a short little description of it and then there's the option to access data and that takes me on to the, the sort of different types of data associated with that study and I can click and then start to see individual uh, records linked to that study and if I just click on it I then get to a bit where I find more description and options to access data. So um, if we just go back to the slides, and what we think now is if you can have a go searching the data catalogue. So there's two options at this point. One option is that you can um, search for your own topic if you kind of got a sense of what it is you're looking for and just try doing different search terms or try browsing for any relevant themes and using some of the techniques to filter by date and see what you find and if you come across anything that seems really confusing you can uh, put your questions in the chat if you're not quite sure how to do it for your own project you can take on the example so um, you can look at data to research the impact of outdoor spaces on mental health and well-being and have a little go and see what you find with that. So we'll sort of give you about seven minutes or so just to have a little look through and see what you come up with. Um, so I've got a question here about studies that have a dissemination embargo. Um, so what this tends to mean is that they, um, so researchers uh, nowadays, if they're, if they're sort of publicly funded, are required to deposit the data that they create. Um, so it, it may be that this is a study that someone's recently done and they've deposited the data, but as part of that process, they're allowed to have a little um, a sort of period in which they can write up their results and get them published before the data is made available to other people. I'd have to look specifically at the study to sort of um, understand more. And that's the type of query that you could come with us to the drop in session on Thursday or contact the help desk to find out for sure. Um, but it might be that it, at this point, it's not available to any other researchers apart from that research team that collected the data. Okay, so hopefully that's given you a little insight into searching the catalogue and some of the issues you might come across. Um, and as I said, it's not necessarily always an easy job. So if you do encounter problems when you're searching, do sort of talk to some of the people that you know or get in contact with our help desk um, and we can see if we can help you. Um, some questions that came up in that session. So um one question was around um trying to find a qualitative study uh, got the answer so data collection only consists of metadata and documentation as the data could not be archived due to legal ethical and commercial constraints so in this case um what happened is is that the sort of qualitative data itself can't be held in the archive most likely because it's just too hard to make it um, not um, identifiable to the people. So this is a big issue with qualitative data and archiving is to make sure that people can't be identified by the data or it doesn't sort of break any of the um, participant confidentiality. Um, but if, if you come across things like that, you can talk to us at the help desk or any named person um, associated with the data and um, see what's possible. 
Um, we did also have someone ask if there's a way to find the most and least used data in the server. And so I think this is factored into um, some of the relevant scores. So if you search um, for data and then uh, sort it by relevance, it will pick up some of the um, more well used data. In our help section as well, if you go to um, the help section, there is some lists of key data sets by data types. So these are organized by sort of survey data, qualitative data, international data. And there's some lists with links to some of the, the most well used ones. And I think that's all the questions that came up at that point. So what I'll do now um, is to move on to talk about accessing data. So when it comes to what you can access for a student project, our main message is that sort of students can access most of the data in our collection, but there are some data sets that cannot be accessed for undergraduate projects. So data sets come with different types of licenses and the difference between them normally reflects differences in um, the ability to sort of identify people in those data sets. So we have some open data sets and these are data sets that are available in our catalogue and you can just download them straight away and share them and use them and without needing to register uh, or do any sort of authentication. Uh, and you can definitely use these in your project. And we have a lot of data that's classed as safeguarded and is available with something called um, the end user license. And these uh, types of data, what you need to do is register with us. And if you're at a UK university, um, you will not. You will use your university login, so it will redirect you to your university login, and you start to register using those details. And you'll need to fill out a short form and agree to some conditions. For those not at a UK university, you need to first um, register to get a um, sort of data archive um, login and password and then you fill in um, the form to agree to conditions after that. So there's a slightly extra step in the process, but otherwise um, it's still fairly straightforward. And once you've registered, you can then um, set up a project and download data to use from then on. So it's not a, a big project it, um, process to do there. Some data comes with some additional conditions that need to be fulfilled before you can access the data. Um, and these may or may not prevent you accessing them. So they, they tend to be um, vary by different studies. And what you need to do is read the details in the catalogue record. Now, one thing to flag up is sometimes fulfilling the conditions, there's no reason why you can't do them, but it does take a little bit of time. So, for example, one of the most common ones is that permission from the data owner is needed to use the data in the way that you want to use it. And that while that might not prevent a student doing an undergraduate dissertation from doing it, it just might take a little bit too long for the time scale that you have for your project. So that's another reason that if you're thinking about using this type of data is to start looking for your data early, just in case you do encounter any of these issues. Um, but most of the data comes without these special conditions. And then finally, we have some uh, control data that's only available under secure access. Um, and this kind of data isn't available to undergraduate students doing projects at the moment. So how do you know if you can access data? So if we go to the next slide, um, the first thing you can do is just to have a look at the title. So often, um, especially if it's a data set associated with one of the big studies, is um, the, the title will include some information about accessibility. So it might include the term secure access, or it might say special license access. So these will be a, a sort of flag that you may or may not be able to access that particular data set. 
And then once you um, click and go through, um, there's a, a the purple button that says access data, if you click on that, then you get all the details. And absolutely, if anything isn't clear at that point, then get in touch and just check with us. So at this point, I think we've got another question for you. So at the moment, what are you thinking you might do for your dissertation? Do you think you might be collecting your own data or thinking about doing some secondary analysis of data from us or from other places, or perhaps you might be looking at doing a combination of the two, so collecting some data and doing some secondary analysis. Wow, so at the moment we've got a 50-50 split between doing secondary analysis and um, a combination of collecting data and doing secondary analysis. Brilliant, so what I'm gonna do is to um, pass this over to Nigel who can talk to you about some things we might have that can help you. I'm just gonna kind of go quite quickly through this um so basically getting started i think the learning hub is the starting place for this and what i'm going to do is pop a link in the chat so you've got it and then go to it and just show you um what it looks like can you see the learning hub now uh, yeah we can yeah, okay. So um, this brings together a number of things that are, are useful. So um, an obvious starting point would be new to using data. Um, so what this does is give you some background on what secondary data analysis is, um, talks about specific modules we have, um, and why sharing research data. And in the final section kind of brings you up to a student's guide to the UK data service. Um, so if I just click on that, it will kind of go through some of the things we're saying, but with more links so you can dive in more detail um, from here. So you can navigate from that student guide down. Um, we've got other sections on data skills, modules, survey data, so the different elements, computational, social science, and a section on the kinds of software and tools. So I don't know where you're up to with what software you're choosing to use, but this gives you some information about the kind of tools, including the one that is available to do basic analysis on the UK data service site itself, Nestar. So for exploring data, you don't necessarily need to be able to use the, um, the packages uh, like SPSS, and Stata and, or R, whichever you've been taught, you can start to look at data using Nestar. Some stuff around geography um, and so on. So just I'm just gonna go into the data skills module. So in here, these are interactive modules supported by videos and quizzes. So you can go through and do these. So you've got an introduction to survey data. If you're looking at longitudinal data, um, and aggregate data. Um, there's also a, one coming soon that's exploring crime surveys with R, and this is a space that we will be adding to over time. So I'm just going to go back to the presentation because I'm conscious we've got, um, we allocated some time for questions. So I'm going to skip over what I've talked about already. So the student guide, the data skills modules, um, and the other guidance. So there are links in the presentation that you'll be able to follow um, when you look at it yourself. But rather than going through all of those, um, what I wanna focus on is the kind of other things we do. So we have a program of events that covers a range of potentially relevant topics. So it's probably worth watching out for those. Um, 
you can get those on the website. Sorry, my links aren't working. And we've also got the YouTube channel um, with recorded videos of sessions that we've done. Um, okay. Do you want to take over again, Jen? So I was going to finish by talking about the dissertation award. So um, we have something for those thinking, um, if you might use, if you're thinking you might use our data in your dissertation, we are running um, a dissertation award this year. Could you put on the slide, Nigel? Um, yeah. So this award aims to um, recognise um, students who have included some analysis of our data in their dissertations and we're looking to award um, the three best dissertations and they'll receive a £300 award and publicity. So who can enter? So it, the award is open to undergraduate students at UK universities doing a dissertation on a social science topic and um, to enter, you need to complete an entry form and send it to us by the 29th of June. And you can find out all the information in the learning hub that Nigel has shown you. So under new users and go to the student section. And um, on the next slide, I'm just going to talk through a little bit about the entry form. So we try to keep it fairly simple. Um, and what we ask for is um, of the, the title of your dissertation and then information about the data that you've used. Um, so you need to describe your research aims and questions. Um, so sort of telling us what you, what you did, uh, what you wanted to find out and why. And then um, describing the data that you've used, why it suited your research method, uh, your research aims and some of the methods that you used. And just to sort of write a little bit about the things that you found out during doing your dissertation and what they might mean um, in terms of sort of policy or something like that. And then you need to include sort of one example of the data that you've used as evidence. So something like a, a really good graph um, or if you're using qualitative data, some codes you've used or a really good interview transcript. So some way that you've used data as part of the dissertation. And in previous years, we've had a really lovely mix of entries with students from using all sorts of different data sets and working on varied topics. So if you do use data uh, in your dissertation accessible from us, please consider entering um, the award. And there's details of past winners um, on the Learning Hub as well. So you can kind of get a sense of which sort of dissertations have um, done well and using the entry form once we'll do that is we'll shortlist and then we'll look at the dissertations uh, of the shortlist we'll send them off to the judging committee and I think that's it for us so I'll just finish off by sort of recapping that there's lots of data that's available to use either on its own or in combination with other data and there's all the resources that we have on the learning hub so do sort of check those out and if you do use our data, then do consider entering um, the dissertation award. 